ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the City Club Forum. My name is Herb Cam. I'm president of the City Club. We are indeed fortunate to have as our speaker today Major General Richard B. Secord, Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for International Security Affairs, who will speak to us on the matter about which you heard a few words lately, the proposed sale of AWAC planes to Saudi Arabia. I want to thank the General in particular for being in here and being with us on short notice. Our scheduled speaker, Francis West, was assigned to other duties as a result of recent developments in Washington and elsewhere. General Secord's specialty is the Near East Africa and South Asia regions. I'm happy to note that he's a native Ohioan, having, having been born in 1932 in LaRue, Ohio. He graduated from high school in Columbus, entered the U.S. Military Academy at West Point in 1951, and graduated in June 1955 with a B.S. degree and a commission in the U.S. Air Force. He received a Master of Science degree in International Affairs from George Washington University. He's also a graduate of the Air Command and Staff College at Maxwell Air Force Base in Alabama and the Naval War College at Newport, Rhode Island. General Secord has a distinguished service record. He was graduated from pilot training in 1956. He has served in Vietnam and Thailand, Thailand and flew 285 combat missions while serving in Southeast Asia. He was chief of the Air Force section of the Military Assistance Advisory Group, and he was director of international programs before assuming his current position. General Secord is a command pilot with more than 4,500 flying hours. His military decorations include the Distinguished Service Medal, the Legion of Merit, and the Distinguished Flying Cross. I might say that if, Mr. if uh, General Secord's face is somewhat familiar to you, it's because he has spent a good many hours in recent weeks testing, testifying before a variety of congressional committees on the proposed AWAC sale. Please join me in extending a warm welcome to Major General Richard B. Secord. Thank you, Mr. Cam. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure for me to be here uh, with you today to address uh, what is uh, an understatement, uh, slightly contentious issue, and certainly very topical and timely. The proposed sale of the AWACS to Saudi Arabia has attracted more heat than uh, many of us have seen before in Washington. I would expect that the issue is going to be resolved in a matter of days. By law, the issue has to be resolved by the 30th of this month. So it's uh, with a good deal of pleasure uh, that I have the opportunity to take the next few minutes to try to lay out for you uh, what I regard to be the administration's case for AWACS. The President's decision to sell this equipment to Saudi Arabia has stimulated deep emotions and intense debate, which have, which have obscured the core issues, in my opinion. We think it's time the real issues be put before Congress and the American people so that they may be examined as dispassionately and fully as this issue requires. The case for the sale of this air defense enhancement package, as we call it, to Saudi Arabia is very simple. The AWACS and the other defense equipment which we propose to sell will make a significant and necessary contribution to the security interests of the United States and of all our allies and friends, including the NATO nations, Japan, and even Israel. The President's decision to proceed with this sale was based upon this central fact as, and was reached only after lengthy review in agreement with the basic decision which was, in fact, reached by the prior administration. As you should be aware, the Saudi Air Defense Enhancement Package uh, actually consists of four components. What we call the E-3A Airborne Warning and Control System Aircraft, or AWACS, to provide necessary low-altitude surveillance and early warning of air attack, along with associated ground-based command control and communications equipment, to provide a complete air defense radar surveillance and control network. In addition, we propose to sell conformal fuel tanks to extend the range and mission endurance of the already approved F-15 fighters for Saudi Arabia. 
The AIM-9L Sidewinder air-to-air missile was also a part of this package, and these are intended to improve the F-15's defensive aerial combat capability, and I'll return to this issue shortly. We also propose to sell six KC-707 aerial tanker aircraft to refuel both the F-15 aircraft and the AWACS aircraft. The total cost of this equipment to Saudi Arabia over the next several years is estimated at $8.5 billion. The Saudi equipment package is an important part of the comprehensive U.S. strategy for Southwest Asia region, and it's designed to increase the security of friendly countries in an area of the world which is vital to both the United States and our allies. In this context, the proposed sale will directly serve U.S. national interests in the following ways. First, it will help the Saudis defend their vital oil facilities against surprise air attacks. In this manner, the sale responds to the legitimate security requirements of a country whose cooperation is central to the defense of the entire region's security, and thus to our own. It also will help to rebuild confidence in the United States as a reliable partner in the region. This sense of confidence and security is, is essential, we believe, in encouraging countries in the area to take the political risks necessary for a durable peace in the Middle East. Further, it will advance our goal of increasing the security of states in the Gulf by providing a foundation for closer U.S. security, defense cooperation, and for Saudi efforts to develop cooperation with all of her Mideast neighbors in other security-related areas. And finally, it will increase the effectiveness of our own military if we were ever called upon to deploy U.S. forces into this area. The extensive logistics base and support infrastructure that will be necessary as a part of this package will be fully compatible with U.S. forces requirements should we have to go into the area. Saudi oil resources, as we all know, are vast and irreplaceable. We need them, and our allies need them. The flow of oil from Saudi Arabia and the countries immediately bordering it in the Gulf are crucial to international finances, domestic production, employment around the, goal, uh, around the globe, and to world trade. In fact, the destruction of the oil gathering and loading facilities in Saudi Arabia or their control by a hostile power could tip the balance of power in the world against us. Saudi oil resources are vulnerable and threatened. Virtually all of Saudi Arabia's oil production facilities are located in the eastern region of Saudi Arabia, right on the Arabian Gulf and easily accessible to attack from across the Gulf. The conflict, the current conflict between Iran and Iraq has disproved one widely held assumption, and that is that oil-producing states acting in their own self-interest would not threaten each other's oil fields refineries or transport facilities, but Iran and Iraq have done just that. Each has been required to curtail oil experts, exports vitally needed by the West as a result of this unfortunate war. And I might add at this point that Saudi Arabia has increased its oil production to accommodate that oil loss while keeping prices below those of its OPEC colleagues. This is simply another of the many instances of Saudi assistance to our national interests. Further, as the anti-communist leader of moderate Arab Gulf states and as the largest free world oil producer, Saudi Arabia needs a strong defense against potential military threats from unstable revolutionary Iran, from Marxist South Yemen, and from other potentially hostile countries in the area. I might also add that the Saudi Kingdom has to increase its current defensive capability against Soviet or Soviet-inspired military threats from Ethiopia, Soviet forces in Afghanistan and from the USSR itself. An additional worrisome fact is the new Entente among Libya, Ethiopia, and South Yemen, just announced at the end of August in Aden, each of which has significant amounts of Soviet military equipment and increasing numbers of Soviet and Soviet bloc advisors. This introduces a new and most unwelcome dimension into the threat calculus of this region. Given this situation, the Saudis face several difficulties in deploying an adequate air defense. This very large country, which is equal to the area east of the Mississippi in the United States, has widely scattered but unfortunately concentrated 
population centers, military installations, ports, airfields, and oil facilities. Most of these valuable targets are on or near the Arabian Gulf and Red Sea coasts, which means that it is not possible to place early warning radars and air defenses far forward, that is to say, between the oil facilities and potential threats from, uh, from across the Gulf, thereby providing adequate protection. With current Saudi capabilities, an attack by a low-flying airplane could not be detected by ground-based radars until it was within two to four minutes of the oil fields. Even under the best of conditions, no Air Force could respond to this threat in time. The AWACS, which is an airborne radar, will allow the Saudi Air Force to detect low-level attacking enemy aircraft up to 200 miles from the airfields. The Saudi Air Force would then have enough time to scramble and intercept enemy aircraft before they reach the oil fields. Without AWACS, it is our judgment that this early warning capability will not exist no matter how many ground radars are employed. A word about the AIM-9L Sidewinder missiles, which we propose to sell. This will give the Saudi Air Force the capability to uh, intercept attacking aircraft in a head-on mode. This capability will greatly improve the chances of shooting them down before they're able to bomb the oil facilities or other Saudi targets. Without the AIM-9L, Saudi interceptors would have to maneuver behind the attacking aircraft in order to fire their older, less capable sidewinders virtually assuring that attacking aircraft could reach the vital targets before being engaged and shot down. The conformal tanks, which are part of this package in the KC-707 tankers, will allow the Saudi F-15s to be based in western, in west central and southwestern Saudi Arabia, where they would not be vulnerable to a surprise attack and from which they could sustain combat over the oil facilities in the east, even if the eastern Saudi Arabian air bases were put out of action. The KC-707 tanker aircraft will also be used to keep the AWACS aircraft uh, aloft for the required amount of time during crisis. Consequently, we believe that Saudi Arabia has a legitimate defense requirement for the AWACS and the other air defense enhancement equipments. This package would provide Saudi capabilities to deter and, if necessary, defend against air attacks. The result would be a much more secure Saudi Arabia, which would be an anchor of stability within the region. And the region, of course, as we all know today, includes Israel. And a bulwark against challenges and coercion from outside action, outside the region. Such a stable and secure Saudi Arabia clearly serves the security interests of the United States and certainly serves, we believe, the security interests of Israel in the long run. Definitely, it is to the advantage of NATO countries and Japan. Last fall, Soon after the outbreak of the Iran-Iraq War, the United States government responded to an urgent Saudi request for assistance by deploying four U.S. Air Force AWACS aircraft to Saudi Arabia to augment their air defenses. They are still there today, providing the surveillance and early warning capability necessary to defend these facilities. This continuing response by the United States has helped in the process of rebuilding Saudi and regional confidence in the United States as a reliable security partner. However, the Saudi government, like any other sovereign government, recognizes its right and responsibility to provide for its own legitimate defense requirements. It is in this spirit that the request to purchase AWACS and other air defense items was made by Saudi Arabia. Consummation of the sale of this equipment, which both we and they agree is urgently needed for the security requirements will further reinforce the military-to-military -military relationship between the United States and Saudi Arabia. This, in turn, will strengthen the security of the entire region, and it will permit us to work with the Saudis toward a more peaceful and stable situation in the whole region, including Israel. On the other hand, there can be little doubt that future U.S.-Saudi relations would be very adversely affected by the rejection of this proposed sale. Such a rejection would cause the Saudis to doubt the reliability of U.S. commitment and the ability of American presence, presidents to conduct foreign policy. Such an impression would also make it far less likely that Saudi Arabia and others will agree to the kinds of security cooperation, joint planning, combined exercises, and advanced preparation for sharing of facilities and support which we feel are needed if the United States is to defend shared security interests in Southwest Asia. Furthermore, the rejection of the sale 
would confirm a too widely held opinion in the Mideast that the United States is concerned with the wishes of the Israeli government to the exclusion of all other interests. This Saudi air defense enhancement package has been designed to meet the significant Saudi defense requirements I've discussed while improving the security of all other states in the region. Also relevant is the fact that Israel has increased its margin of military superiority over its Arab adversaries since the 1973 war. With or without the AWACS and F-15 enhancements, the Saudi Air Force realistically poses no significant threat to the security of Israel. This is true even in the context of a general regional conflict. Moreover, this assessment is solidly supported by the United States intelligence community. These are the technical facts. AWACS is an unarmed flying radar platform which has no intelligence collection capability. It cannot detect ground targets such as tanks. It cannot operate effectively with air forces of other countries without extensive joint training and sophisticated communications networks which only the United States could provide. The five AWACS aircraft which would be sold to Saudi Arabia are sufficient to maintain only one continuous airborne surveillance orbit, and that only for a matter of a few days. Israel's air defense system makes many arguments, many of these arguments against the AWACS academic. The Saudis fully recognize that Israel's air defense is an extraordinarily capable one. Saudi missions into Israeli airspace, either to engage Israeli aircraft or to strike Israeli targets, would be prohibitively costly and would leave Saudi Arabia nakedly vulnerable to air attack from virtually any direction. The simple fact is that this sale will not alter the Arab-Israeli balance of power materially nor jeopardize Israel's security. President Reagan is committed to protecting Israel's security and to preserving Israel's qualitative edge and its ability to defeat any combination of hostile forces in the region. The proposed Saudi sale neither casts doubt on that commitment nor compromises Israeli capabilities. There is also an additional point which is related to the issue of Israeli security. The Saudis do not face a choice between AWACS or nothing. The British Nimrod airborne early warning aircraft, currently in advanced development, has capabilities comparable to the AWACS and which could be easily enhanced. Nimrods will be operationally deployed shortly, and the Saudis would turn to the British to purchase these aircraft should AWACS be denied. Therefore, the issue is not whether the Saudis will obtain an enhanced air defense capability. Rather, it is whether we will lose all credibility with the Saudis, their moderate neighbors, and many other countries, and the ability to develop a Mideast policy by refusing to sell. We have the choice of benefiting from the closer security cooperation and the economic benefits which would flow from the sale of the U.S. equipment packaged to Saudi Arabia, or yielding the friendship of valuable allies. For the Israelis, the question is whether their long-term security interests are better served by a continuing and strengthened U.S. role in Saudi Arabia, or by a Saudi Arabia with all the increased military capabilities the foreign AWACS would bring, but far less friendly to U.S. to the U.S. and with continuing, perhaps unneeded hostility from Israel. The AWACS is a very capable system, but selling it to Saudi Arabia does not pose serious risks that sensitive technology will be compromised. The AWACS does not represent the ultimate in U.S. radar and computer technology, as has been alleged. The radar is mid-1960s textbook technology, and a comparable commercial computer is available uh, easily. While these systems are superior to anything the Soviets currently have in their operational inventory, a new Soviet airborne early warning aircraft is currently under development, and we expect to see it fielded in, in uh, sizable numbers in about a year, year and a half. And I might point out this is well before we intend to deliver the first Saudi AWACS, uh, which would be in uh, late 1985. The Saudis have agreed to ensure an important U.S. role in the development of the Saudi air defense system and to move forward in other ways to deepen the longstanding security cooperation between our two countries, in which we have played a key role in training the Saudi Air Force over the past 30 years. Within this framework, 
We have reached understandings on a number of specific provisions governing the AWACS aircraft that provide important benefits for U.S. security interests. <coughs> These arrangements have been reached in the context of firm Saudi agreement on information sharing, security of equipment, no unauthorized transfer of data or equipment, and use of the AWACS only in a defensive mission within the Saudi borders. This means there will be a complete data sharing with the United States on a continuous basis. There will be no sharing of AWACS data with other parties without specific U.S. prior consent. Only carefully screened Saudi and U.S. nationals will be permitted to be involved with these aircraft. Given the shortage of Saudi air crews and technicians, this means that there will be an American presence in the aircraft and on the ground well into the 1990s. There will be no operations of Saudi AWACS outside Saudi airspace. There will be extensive and elaborate security measures for safeguarding equipment and technology, including U.S. inspection teams to monitor the performance of all equipment associated with the AWACS sale, special facilities to be constructed to provide round-the-clock security protection against unauthorized entry. All of the agreed arrangements for protecting the security of AWACS must be approved by the United States at least one year before any AWACS are delivered to the Saudis. Taken together, this package of safeguards and agreements addresses the fundamental concerns that have been voiced about the sale and also reflects the Saudi willingness to work with us and to engage in our mutual concerns. Far more is involved in the proposed arms sales to Saudi Arabia than the technical capabilities of five aircraft. At stake is whether the United States will be able to pursue a coherent policy in a region where the Arab-Israeli dispute divides our closest friends and where the Soviets and their proxies threaten our vital interests. Our strategy must vigorously pursue both peace and security. Progress toward each of these twin goals supports progress toward the other. If our friends are more secure, they will be more able to take risks for peace. If there is progress toward peace, the cooperation that is vital for security will be easier. Let me conclude by saying that we are convinced, and the President is convinced, that detailed and dispassionate analysis shows that the proposed air defense enhancement package for Saudi Arabia will make an important contribution to the security of all the states of the region. Israel as well as Saudi Arabia, and that it will promote our efforts to create a strategic consensus in the Southwest Asia region and thereby further our national security interests. This proposed sale successfully balances the imperative of Israeli security with the need to respond to threats to essential natural resources and regional capability and regional stability. It provides equipment which meets the defensive requirements of a close friend and key state in the region in a way which also protects sensitive technology and makes a tangible contribution to United States military capabilities. Ladies and gentlemen, I would submit to you that since the assassination of Anwar Sadat, which is the reason why my boss, Francis uh, West, cannot be with you today since he went uh, with the American delegation to Cairo last night, makes it more imperative than ever that we conclude successfully this sale of the airborne warning and control system to Saudi Arabia. We do not dare, in my judgment, slap our second most powerful friend in the region in the face at this uh, crucial time. I think that you will see this new element being seriously considered by the senators during the period of recess, which they uh, entered uh, on, into yesterday. We expect uh, the uh, various committee votes and the vote on the uh, floor of the Senate to take place uh, sometime around the 20th this month. Uh, by statute, uh, the vote has to take place before the 30th. So these are interesting uh, times we have in front of us in the next few days. And I would submit to you that uh, an historic decision is about to be undertaken here. Uh, that ends my prepared comments, and I'd be uh, very happy to try to cope with some of the questions from the floor. Thank you, General Secord. Today at the City Club, uh, we are listening to Major General Richard B. Secord, Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for International Security Affairs, who is speaking to us about the proposed sale of five AWACS planes to Saudi Arabia. 
We'll begin our question and answer session in just a moment, but first a few brief announcements. Let me once again remind you that donations to the City Club Foundation are welcome. And I might add that we are uh, accepting donations as well to a special fund which has been established in honor and the memory of the late uh, Sidney Adnor, the former president of the club, as you know, and one of its most devoted members for many years. You can make donations to the Forum Foundation Direct or to the Sidney Andorn Memorial Fund through the foundation, and you can send those that are tax deductible, incidentally, to the Forum Foundation, 320 Superior Avenue, Cleveland, 44114. And if you're not aware, the donations that you make to the foundation make it possible for us to maintain the high standards of the speakers we have at this forum, as typified by the presence today of Major General Richard Secor. Next week, we'll present the first of two debates between candidates for the Cleveland Board of Education, probably the most important aspect of the November 3rd election. So important is this race, as a matter of fact, and so numerous are the candidates that we are devoting two forums to this, one next Friday and a second the Friday following that. The participants in uh, next Friday's forum will be Amy Belvin, William Haas, Gerald Kisner, Donald Nance, Laird Smith, Joseph T. Green, and John Uren. We expect a very large turnout for this forum, so you'd be well advised to make your reservations well in advance. We are ready now, I trust you are too, General, for questions from our audience. We have two microphones, one at the front with Bob Cavano, one at the rear with Darrell Alt. Raise your hand to be recognized. Please make your question as direct and as brief as possible. Let's have the first question. General Secor. General, having made a <clears throat> brilliant analysis of the unstable and volatile situation in the Middle East, when do you expect World War III to begin? <laughs> <laughs> the, the question is a uh, serious one, uh, because certainly World War III could spring from the situation that obtains there today. We believe that... Uh, our uh, Southwest Asia strategy, which we are erecting now, will deter such a conflict. But the Soviet Union, make no mistake, has its eye on the great prize in that region, which is the Saudi Arabian Peninsula and the resources that go with it. The, so the uh, Soviets have established uh, very, very worrisome positions of power all around that peninsula. I don't need to... Uh, go into the situation in Afghanistan, the uh, tremendous instability, Iran-Iraq, where that's going, no one knows, but the Soviets will seek to exploit it when the uh, fighting uh, cools, and they will attempt to establish uh, a sphere of influence in, in, uh, in Iran, I would say. The Soviets have a very strong lodgment to the south and the southern part of uh, the, the Saudi uh, Peninsula in South Yemen. There are approximately 1,500 so-called Soviet advisors there and about 500 Cubans in a very, very small place. There are thousands of uh, Soviet advisors in Africa and uh, most especially in this context uh, in uh, Ethiopia along with their Cuban combat troops. The uh, Saudi authorities see themselves being uh, not slowly but rapidly encircled and they're very worried. The United States uh, is their only powerful friend. But make no mistake, the Saudi government is perfectly capable of changing its policy if they think it's necessary uh, to uh, preserve the, the government. So I don't expect World War III to start, sir, in the near term, but I certainly wouldn't uh, rule out very serious conflict in that region in the near term. Therefore, we must be uh, prepared with our rapid deployment force and with our Southwest Asia strategy. We believe that this AWACS sale is an integral part and a necessary part of that strategy. General Secord, you speak clearly, and I accept that the Soviets are, are indeed our enemy. Uh, my study also leads me to conclude that we are indeed the major supplier of arms to the world. In fact, military spending now exceeds the total gross national product of those starving nations in the world. As a military expert, when and how will this 30-year trend be reversed? The arms race in the world is uh, 
a matter of great concern to this administration and to previous administrations. Uh, the arms race is generally divided into two categories, strategic or nuclear and conventional. But the conventional arms race, uh, which I think you're addressing, is uh, almost as worrisome as is the nuclear arms race. New SALT talks uh, are imperative if we are to uh, get a handle on the nuclear arms race. With respect to conventional arms, uh, it's a much more uh, difficult situation to assess. The Carter administration attempted to uh, uh, have uh, SALT-like talks on conventional arms. They were called CAT talks, conventional arms transfer talks. Uh, these talks uh, with the Soviet Union uh, were totally unsuccessful, unsuccessful and uh, that course of action was abandoned. I don't know when the, the uh, trend in spending on arms can be reversed. I do know that uh, in this very dangerous world that we live in, that there is only one universal language that is well understood, and that is power. The language of power is understood. The United States has to maintain a, uh, a great military strength. We can't afford to pay for it all ourselves. We need to have friends and allies also in uh, favorable military uh, situations. And this sale, we think, enhances uh, the uh, defensive posture of a very financially powerful friend. General Secor, this morning in the papers, Senate person Nancy Kossenbaum Koss stated that um, she feels we should take a gamble on the sale. And if I can only quote from you, you said a political risk. Uh, history has shown us in the past 10 years that we took gambles on military sales to Iran and to South Vietnam. Today, South Vietnam has the third largest air force in the world made up of most of our equipment. And Iran, F-14 fighters were flying over the hostages on their way to combat missions in Iraq. What guarantee do we have that these AWACS won't fall into the wrong hands should a coup occur? And should I remind you this morning in Egypt with the assassination of one man, there's now a lot of political unrest in that country. The, um War in South Vietnam uh, was lost, and we're still paying the penalty for that. Uh, fortunately, they operate our equipment, uh, equipment that remains behind only with great difficulty and at very low operational rates. In Iran, I was the commander of the Air Force, uh, U.S. Air Force in Iran for three years, 1975 to 78, and uh, managed the deployment of most of the arms, which you uh, have reference to. Uh, the Iranians uh, have had great difficulty operating uh, their aircraft uh, since we left. Their operational readiness rates have uh, decreased uh, tremendously due to lack of spare parts and trained technicians. Uh, they can fly only a handful of their airplanes right now. Uh, nonetheless, uh, it's certainly a, a uh, very worrisome thing that uh, we lost uh, such really advanced weapons in Iran. We have military assistance programs in over 60 countries in the world, however. And I would submit to you that uh, since World War II, it has been a, an organic part of every administration's foreign policy, a vital part. Uh, the military assistance programs worldwide have been, in, in large part, very, very successful. We have had some setbacks. You've mentioned two of them. There have been others. Uh, there is no 100% uh, assuredness in this game. I can't even give it 90%. I tried to explain the... Uh, situation with respect to AWACS. There's a good deal of misinformation about uh, AWACS. The AWACS is 1960s technology. It is not a magic machine. It's a good machine, but it's old and getting older. By the time the Saudis get it, it'll be another four years at minimum before they would be able to even hope to operate it independently. It'll be 1990. I suspect that by 1990, uh, if the Saudi uh, Arabian, uh, or even by 1985, if uh, Saudi Arabia were to uh, succumb to radical revolution or to be conquered uh, from without, the loss of the AWACS would be uh, an infinitesimal concern compared to the other concerns that we have. I hope that answers the question. Uh, General, sir, uh, despite strong uh, objections in Congress, the sale of AWACS to Iran was approved, but the planes were never shipped uh, when the Shah was overthrown. What makes you think we are any less vulnerable uh, with a country so weak that it could not prevent the seizure and lasting occupation of their most holy 
our mosque, the holy Mecca. Uh, let me address the, uh, uh, the Mecca incident first. The Mecca incident, after careful analysis by ourselves and by several European uh, friendly countries, uh, tells us that the Saudis uh, were surprised there by the uh, attack which took place. They were shocked. It's the holiest place in the, in the world of Islam, as you know. They did move uh, expeditiously to clear out the, uh, the terrorist attack, which were uh, Shiite uh, radicals. They moved very, very carefully, however, because they did not want to destroy the holiest place in Islam. So they, in effect, traded uh, casualties for uh, destruction, and it took them, uh, I've forgotten, but uh, a week or so to clear, clear out the area. I've seen the area uh, from afar. It's a, quite a, a large area, and I understand uh, it's a very, very uh, much a catacomb kind of situation within the walls, and it's, it's just a simple uh, uh, digging out process that had to be undertaken, and it was quite difficult. Uh, we believe that the uh, Saudi security forces did a creditable job in that incident. So I think that there have been many, many misleading uh, stories in the media on that point. With respect to uh, the uh, chances of... Uh, uh, the AWACS and its associated uh, technology falling into unfriendly hands as a result of the conquering of uh, Saudi Arabia in the future or the overthrow of the current very friendly government. I think I addressed that earlier, and uh, I think that uh, is about all I have to say on that point. Thank you. If we go ahead with the sale, uh, would we be under uh, any pressures from the Kuwaitis and the United Arab Republic and eventually Pakistan and others as a test of our friendship to sell them uh, AWACS. And uh, once they have uh, AWACS, they'll need some <coughs> further enhancement. And uh, we could be um, <coughs> creating a powder keg in that region. Um, I guess another part of the question would be, shouldn't we have gone to some sort of mutual assistance agreement involving all of these countries together, rather than uh, simply an isolated sale to, <coughs> albeit one power, um, and by getting an assistance agreement, um, <clears throat> sewing them up into some sort of, uh, of responsible, uh, you know, total agreement that uh, would be carried out. A new NATO or new CETO or new Baghdad Pact, uh, of course, has uh, been discussed by many. We do not believe that it's possible given the political realities of today. Let me address the points that you made uh, specifically and see if I can make uh, some sense of the, of the situation for you. With respect to Kuwait, UAE, Qatar, and Oman, they are now, as of this year, uh, involved in uh, the Gulf Cooperative Council, a new uh, organization along with Saudi Arabia, the GCC. It is our hope that with United States assistance, over a number of years in the future, we will be able to erect an integrated air defense system involving all those countries, and I should have mentioned Bahrain as well. Uh, each of those countries are very small. Kuwait, of course, is rich, but each of them are very small and have very small defense establishments. It would be in each of their, and they're all very friendly with uh, Saudi Arabia. It would be in their mutual interest, of course, to uh, erect ground radar st stations and ground command control stations and share AWACS data. It is our hope that this will eventuate, and that is uh, what we're looking toward. The terms of the uh, internetting of these states under the terms of the sale of AWACS to Saudi Arabia will be subject to U.S. ratification. Pakistan, of course, is far out of that region, and has uh, defense problems uh, that uh, cannot be uh, closely tied to the defense of the Gulf. Uh, Pakistan, as you may have uh, noted, uh, has been involved with uh, us in recent months in close discussions on the uh, security assistance front, the military assistance front. Uh, we have agreed to sell them uh, a very small number of F-16 aircraft, and we'll agree to sell them uh, some other uh, uh, ordinary kinds of uh, ground forces equipment. But they're in a real bind there. They're uh, faced with uh, the Soviets and the Afghans in the north, a hostile and huge and powerful India in the east a chaotic Iran in the West, which used to be very friendly and a uh, source of stability and confidence for the PACs, and sharks to the South. The uh, United States uh, 
capabilities to defend mutually Pakistan are, uh, you know, subject of considerable debate. Uh, I can only assure you that in a bilateral way, we are consulting with Pakistan now on this very knotty defense problem. It's a very worrisome one. I do not believe, just to conclude this lengthy answer, that it is feasible in today's world to erect another uh, mutual uh, defense alliance in that area. The Baghdad Pact, or, or uh, uh, CENTO, which existed uh, on paper at least uh, for many years, failed. I see no reason to think that uh, the states in that region are ready to band together uh, under our uh, umbrella now. We believe that bilateralism is the way to go at this time. Corps recently, Libya has made some threats against the Sudan, and Egypt has said if this happens, they will come in to, uh, to defend the Sudan. Uh, how does the Defense Department look at this? Is that a, a reasonable threat? Might something happen there? And if it does, uh, is Egypt equipped militarily to defend that effectively against Libya? What is the balance of power between Libya and Egypt? That's a good question. It's one I can, I'll be honest with you, it's one I can only address in an unclassified form in part. I'll do the best I can. I mentioned uh, during my prepared remarks that uh, Gaddafi and uh, the People's Democratic Republic of Yemen, South Yemen, and Ethiopia in the last of August entered into a new pact. They made no secret of the objectives of this alliance, that is to uh, threaten and to overthrow Saudi Arabia, to consolidate North Yemen, and to uh, take on Somalia, and of course Sudan. We believe that Sudan is the number one target at the moment. Uh, this is because of the geography of the matter. Uh, the Libyans, of course, have been campaigning in Chad, which is uh, that state which lies between Libya in the part of, uh, in the center part of uh, Africa, lies between Libya and, and uh, Sudan. Sudan is a vital concern in a classical sense. That means an interest which uh, Egypt would be war uh, willing to go to war over. It is a vital interest of Egypt for a couple of very good reasons. Uh, number one, it controls the headwaters of the Nile, which is the lifeblood of uh, Egypt. Number two, it has provided political support for Egypt in the Camp David framework. It is the only large Arab state which has provided uh, political support for the Camp David agreements, uh, Oman being the only other uh, Arab state, period. So uh, Egypt uh, relies upon Numeri in Sudan for political support, uh, for military support in the south, and of course uh, they rely upon them to uh, maintain the flow of the Nile. Uh, Gaddafi's uh, forces have been campaigning in Chad now over the past year, and they have uh, pretty much consolidated uh, control of all of Chad. There is some uh, irregular warfare going on, uh, but it's uh, very limited in scope and, uh, and not very effective. There uh, have been attacks in recent weeks by uh, uh, Libyan uh, light aircraft against uh, villages on the western border of Sudan. This is causing great uh, concern uh, in the capital, as it uh, would in any capital. It is a very difficult situation for a government uh, to be uh, under attack by uh, aircraft, even on its border areas, and not be able to defend it. Even if these attacks are militarily insignificant, the political consequences can be great. Sudan is an economically weak uh, country, impoverished. They can't afford uh, large expenditures on arms. Now, you asked the question about the balance of military power between Egypt and Libya. I would say that Egypt is uh, capable of uh, quickly defeating any attack by Libya. However, Egypt, uh, if you put it the other way around and say, can Egypt attack, uh, uh, I, let me get this straight, I may have uh, confused myself. The Egyptians are capable of defeating any Libyan attack. On the other hand, we don't see the Egyptians having the power to, like Rommel, drive across North Africa and, uh, and crush Libya, because Libya in recent years has become a good client of the Soviet Union. They have 2,500-plus modern tanks there. Uh, 
they don't have enough uh, people and camel drivers to uh, man that many tanks. They have uh, many hundreds of modern combat aircraft, including the latest uh, MiG-25 Fox Bats, and they present a considerable problem. Uh, it is a very dangerous situation at the moment, and uh, we are talking with the uh, Egyptian government about this very situation now. Uh, General, two questions. First of all, is it not true that the American military establishment is not universal in its approval of the sale of AWACS? As a matter of fact, I think I heard the other day that the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff is against it. And secondly, what kind of role would the AWACS play in a situation like the uh, Israeli attack on the Iraqi uh, nuclear reactor? Mm -hmm. The uh, AWACS was airborne during the... Uh, Israeli uh, F-16 attack on Osiris. The uh, AWACS uh, orbit, uh, which is set to defend the uh, Ras Tenora area of uh, eastern, the eastern provinces of Saudi Arabia, was well out of range of this activity and therefore didn't see it. A lot of people think that the AWACS can see everything, yeah. but it has uh, finite limits imposed upon it by the laws of physics. And uh, unfortunately, uh, they were uh, uh, quite far to the south. I say unfortunately because although probably nothing would have come of it uh, owing to the communications links that we have out there, it would have been interesting to have seen the tracks. Uh, the Israelis uh, have said uh, several times that they uh, wouldn't like to see AWACS because perhaps it would be orbited farther north in Saudi Arabia at some time and they wouldn't be able to uh, execute uh, preemptive attacks. That argument hasn't gotten much sympathy in my building. Uh, with respect to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, he wholeheartedly supports the uh, uh, sale of AWACS, has been uh, instrumental in uh, advancing the sale, testified uh, to that in front of the House, uh, the Senate Armed Services Committee uh, last week, and, will, and has testified in front of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee this, uh, just this week. And uh, I know Dave Jones very well, and I assure you he supports the sale. Perhaps you've misread recent pronouncements by the chairman with respect to MX. There is some debate on MX, which I won't get into. Uh, you made one other point. The universal agreement within the military. There's no, not universal agreement on the military in the military on anything, up to and, <laughs> up to and including motherhood, I suppose. <laughs> but the military people that I know come close to universally supporting this. You have stated we want to keep friendly relations with Saudi Arabia as well as keep the peace in the Middle East. If this be true, then rather than sell AWACS to the Saudis, wouldn't it be more fruitful if the United States were to pursue a position of supporting the recent proposal of the Saudi Arabias for a solution to the main question in the Middle East, and that is the question of Palestine, where they put forth a proposal to guarantee the borders of Israel recognize the PLO, and also give the Palestinians autonomy. I don't know if that was a question or a statement, but uh, it's uh, essentially a question, as I understand it, of uh, why wouldn't the United States uh, abandon the Camp David framework at this point and support Crown Prince Fahad's eight points, which were put forth uh, about uh, six weeks ago. Uh, I'm not from the State Department. My business is the military business, and uh, I'm really not authorized to get into uh, that kind of a question. I could talk to you afterwards about my personal views. I wouldn't want for attribution to uh, address that question. But uh, I do not believe the Crown Prince's uh, eight points have gone unnoticed by the Secretary of State. I can assure you that. General, the uh, Saudis, both political leaders and religious leaders, have uh, in recent times indicated an intent uh, against that of Israel. Uh, also, you've indicated that the AWACS would uh, increase the capability of the F-15 fighters that have already been sold. My question to you is, in uh, 1978, at the time, I believe, when the AWACS sales were being, uh, excuse me, the F-15 sales were being considered by Congress, the Department of Defense made assurances to the Congress that no further uh, sale of additional technology which would increase the capability of the F-15s would be recommended by the department. Now it appears that uh, in another administration, the same department is completely reversing that position. My question is, what is the morality, not the political considerations, but the morality 
of the executive branch of this government changing so substantially a position that it made and an assurance that it made to the Congress at the time now when you're asking them to approve that additional technology to Im improve the, really the offensive capability of the F-15. The 1978 letter of assurances uh, to the Congress uh, to support the sale of the 60 F-15s to Saudi Arabia signed by then Secretary of Defense Harold Brown in May was based upon the situation that obtained at that time in the region. That was before the ouster of the Shah, which had been a tremendous friend of the United States and provided a vital buffer between the oil fields and the Soviet Union. Before the Iran-Iraq War, before the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, before the increase uh, in the Soviet presence in South Yemen, before the 1979 uh, North Yemen-South Yemen War, and before a number of other things. Nothing in this business is immutable. The assurances are being, the, uh, with respect to the morality, we believe we were on a very moral course, otherwise we would have ignored the assurances and proceeded to uh, make these sales in piecemeal fashion and thereby dodge the Arms Export Control Act requirements to submit it to Congress. We could have done that easily. But instead, the President is abiding by the assurances to the Congress and has put the case before the Congress for amendments to these assurances in view of Soviet pressure in the region and in view of the tremendous threat to our vital interests in the region. So I think that... Uh, You've got uh, a real problem of logic uh, accusing the administration of uh, being uh, duplicitous on this score. With respect to the, uh, uh, in the enhancement of the F-15 offensive capability, which is what I think you were getting at with respect to operating uh, in tandem with AWACS, I brushed on that in my uh, speech, uh, but let me just say that uh, since we invented AWACS and F-15 and since we operate them, we know a lot about them. We know that uh, it takes a great deal of training to use uh, the AWACS and any fighter aircraft in the offensive role. Now, the only role that the AWACS can perform in offense is that of command and control. He could stand back behind the attacking fighters and call out enemy interceptors as they were uh, coming up to intercept the attacking force and perhaps provide some navigational assistance. In order for the uh, Saudi AWACS to perform this uh, kind of uh, activity, in an attack against Israel, they would have to overfly Jordan first, since Jordan lies between uh, the two states. And we have very detailed analyses that show that, uh, that this is going to be a long, hot, and short run. So uh, knowing the, uh, the Saudis, I don't think that there's much concern there. I think that uh, answers the points that you made. Oh, the uh, anti-Israeli uh, uh, rhetoric by the, the Saudi government. This is a matter of great concern to us, and it doesn't help us at all, but I would uh, only say that there's been an awful lot of anti-Saudi rhetoric on the part of the uh, State of Israel as well. I think we only have about four minutes remaining. You've referred to Saudi Arabia as one of our closest friends. Has Saudi Arabia made any commitments to support the peace efforts initiated by the United States through the Camp David Accords um, in exchange for the military package? Once again, I'm not the, uh, the regular crew chief on this one, but uh, I'll do the best I can. As I think you know, the uh, subsequent to Camp David in 1979, the Saudis and uh, nearly every other Arab state that Baghdad announced their rejection of that pact. They believed it did not go far enough. Uh, they supported the uh, principle of withdrawal from the Sinai and uh, the principle of proceeding with the talks, but not in a bilateral framework. They felt that uh, it was uh, an anti-Arab uh, 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 measure. Uh, in some ways, I guess they have been right, uh, haven't they? Because uh, although we have achieved uh, agreement on the pullback from the Sinai, which is to terminate uh, by next April, God willing, uh, we have not made any progress in some of the other uh, uh, important areas. Now, this is a difficult, uh, tremendously difficult problem, the, uh, the uh, Palestinian problem, one that has been tackled by successive administrations in this country without much success. I think we understand the position of the Arabs. They have to maintain their position uh, within the uh, Arab world. They only have four million people. They're very, very wealthy. They're a great target. And uh, they don't want to uh, become targets themselves. They have to cooperate to graduate. Time for perhaps one more question. Mm -hmm. 
General Secord, you mentioned the apparent failure of the cap talks on conventional weapons limitations. In 76 and 79, Russia offered to sign a mutual agreement that neither side would be the first to use nuclear weapons. The Carter administration refused both offers. The media generally failed to report the offers to the American people. Why can't we pledge not to use the unusual? Isn't it time we have a nuclear freeze? We have 30,000 nuclear weapons, the Russians some 20,000. Sir, I'm afraid I'm not competent to address that. I'm not familiar with the offer that you say the Soviets made in 76 and 79. Are you, Dick? I just have to dodge that one. I'm sorry. General, you spoke in your prepared remarks. Saudi Arabia is our trusted ally, and that the AWACS would present also a benefit to Israel and only be used against an attack on the oil fields, mostly, most likely by the Soviet Union. How do you equate this fact that on the recent visit of our Secretary Haig, the Saudis informed him that the greatest enemy to Saudi Arabia is Israel and not the Soviet Union? In my prepared remarks, I did not intend to convey the idea that the AWACS would be used only to defend the oil fields. It would be used to defend all the vital targets that the Saudis have, including their population centers. Nor did I mean to convey the notion that it would be deployed solely in anticipation of a Soviet attack. In fact, we believe that the Soviets would continue to work through indirection and more likely in the foreseeable future, attacks by Iranian or attacks from the south out of the Yemen are more likely. It is possible, of course, in a more generalized conflict scenario for them to be confronted with Soviet attacks. And in this context, I frequently ask the question, do you expect the Saudis to stand up to the Soviet Union? That's nonsense. They'd fold in a minute. Well, what we expect them to do is to get the early warning, to put their fighters up, and to give us sufficient time to deploy our own fighter squadrons into the region and operate with them against the Soviets. With respect to the Hague visit, which was last April or May, as I recall, I don't recall that the Saudis said that Israel was their only enemy. This is, and of course, there's a lot of rhetoric involved in this, too. I see we've run out of time. I thank you very much. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you, General Secord. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us at today's City Club Forum. The City Club Forum is adjourned.